Well, I'm really honored to get to be here to tell you a part of the story today. And I, I do want to say uh, very much to Cato Institute, thank you for filing the amicus brief on our uh, behalf in this case. Uh, as Dan was going through that chronology at the beginning, probably, probably many of you were thinking back to the television stories you saw at the time or the radio reports, or you were thinking of the newspaper headlines from those days in May and June. As I heard that, I was having the experience I was going through a train wreck all over again. A friend of mine survived a terrible airplane crash a few years ago, and he said, you know, it was a horrifying experience, but I'll always remember it as one of the most interesting experiences of my life. And that's kind of what this case has been. I noticed several eyebrows go up when Dan gave my resume, and he mentioned that I happen to be a geologist. And I, I will tell you, as a geologist, I never imagined I would end up at the United States Supreme Court. Uh, if someone had told me when I sought this office in 2006 that while I served as state treasurer, I'd be part of the biggest financial meltdown in history and be involved with a Supreme Court case that has what I think are just huge implications for where we go forward in finance, I probably would have thought, find somebody else to do this job. This story from the Indiana point of view, and I'll kind of fill in a few gaps and perhaps put not just the letter of the law on it, but kind of give you a personal side of what was happening through this case. This case as it unfolded in Indiana had huge implications. We have over 6,000 Chrysler employees in the state of Indiana. We have uh, nearly twice that many General Motors employees in the state of Indiana. And as was mentioned, we also have Honda and we have Toyota and we have Isuzu. Uh, Indiana, though you may not know it, we are the motor state. Uh, used to be Michigan, not so much anymore. It's Indiana. And when the Chrysler bankruptcy was announced, I had no idea that we would be involved in this case to the way that we were. From our historical perspective, the state of Indiana had three funds that had bought that secured debt of Chrysler Corporation. One is the Indiana Teachers Retirement Fund, uh, for which I have no legal authority, by the way. I simply served as their representative in this case. The Indiana State Police Pension Fund, I am the sole trustee of that fund, and an infrastructure fund that I serve effectively as trustee, the Major Moves Construction Fund. Those three funds bought $43 million worth of secured debt of Chrysler Corporation in July of 2007. And you might think, well, gee, back then uh, that wasn't the best of times even for the automotive industry. Why did you buy that stuff? And the answer was, and I'm sorry, I said 2007, it was 2008. Uh, we bought it in July of 2008. Yeah, the auto industry was uh, sucking wind, to put it mildly, but it was steeply discounted at 43 cents on the dollar, so we effectively paid $17 million. And we bought it for a very basic reason, aside from the fact it was secured. We also have in our state, as most states do, the open policy of trying to support businesses that have a big footprint in that state. And so when we bought that debt of Chrysler, we were hoping to be a party to their success never imagining that eight weeks later when Lehman Brothers went down and the stock market went down that we would be dragged in to this incredible struggle. As was said here, the bankruptcy was announced in uh, late April. It was actually April 30th of 2009. It happened after, and as a Republican, it pains me to say this, but it started with, as Dan correctly pointed out, the Bush administration starting to use money from TARP and we ultimately said that that was an illegal use of those funds. Even we have records now that show as early as in late February, uh, early March, the United States government in many ways began running Chrysler Corporation. And we know that from a chain of emails that was going back and forth that came to us through the discovery process. When the bankruptcy was announced, two things were said that immediately should have put every American's nerves on edge, I think. It was said it would be the most complex bankruptcy in American history. And secondly, it was said it would be completed in 30 days. <laughs> Think of that. I mean, if you've ever been involved with a bankruptcy, and they normally last months, if not years, some last decades. And yet this, the most complex bankruptcy in American history, we were told was going to be pushed through in less than 30 days. One of the reasons that was given was that the potential buyer, Fiat, was going to walk away if the deal wasn't done by then. Well, as you heard the professor say, they didn't have to invest a penny. I kept saying all through this process, slow it down, slow it down. The government was saying Fiat will walk away. 
And I said, you know what? You give me $400 million. If you don't give it to me on Monday, you tell me to come back on Tuesday. I promise. I'll be back. <laughs> Indeed, on the day the sale, I call it the gift, took place to Fiat, the president and chairman of Fiat Corporation, Sergio Marchione, said, I don't know where the date came from. It never came from us. Think about that. That was the so-called reason for pushing this thing through from the U.S. government. And yet the head of the corporation that was getting the gift said it didn't come from them. It was all part of the orchestrated plan to just shove this through at any price, make it happen. When that announcement was made about the bankruptcy on that day, as indicated on the slide, there were $6.9 billion of senior secured debt. Of that 6.9, 6.6 was held by the biggest banks. 300 million was held by private equity funds and pension funds. And that's where we are. That's where Indiana is. And the professor mentioned this, but I just want to add the emphasis here. And you can tell I'm getting angry, okay? I've told this story at least 70 times from a podium. Every time I still get angry. That $6.6 billion was held by the largest TARP banks. The day of the bankruptcy, they all said, well, you know what? If we've worked with Chrysler for years. We understand the finances. We saw their sheets in December at the close of the year. There's billions of assets. We expect 100 cents on the dollar. And it was the government, not Chrysler Corporation, that said, no, you're not getting 100 cents. But, but, but we're secured creditors. Doesn't matter. Three days later, they effectively all walked in a room, smiles on their faces, and said, we're going to take 29 cents. Every one of you should wonder what the heck happened. And the professor told you what happened. This whole class of secured creditors had been made prostitute by the fact that they had received the TARP monies. How impossible is it to imagine that the officials of the United States Treasury didn't say to those folks, don't you boys get it? We've told you, you're too big to fail. We've told you. We put $90 billion in your collective banks. You don't have to worry about losses anymore. American taxpayers got your back. I return to that $300 million tranche. Held by those private equity funds, it was very clear, and the pension funds, nobody had our back. Nobody told us that we were too big to fail. Almost immediately, leaders, executives from those private equity funds went rushing to the courthouse in the bankruptcy trial or bankruptcy of New York to file suits and file complaints to stop the sale. The next day, the President of the United States said, anyone who would try to stop the Chrysler bankruptcy was an unpatriotic American, unwilling to sacrifice unwilling to sacrifice for the community. That was pretty shocking stuff to me, especially representing teachers and state police. But the story becomes a little bit personal here. You know, I know a woman who uh, is retired, spent most of her career working in schools. She's not a teacher, but spent working in schools. She's getting a pension from a teacher's pension fund. I know a man who is a retired state police officer. And they're my parents. They both served in World War II in the United States Navy. They are not unpatriotic Americans. I should add for the record, they're not from Indiana either. But they are the type of people that were affected by this bankruptcy and by the overreaching of the federal government to have their resources ripped away from them. It is wrong. It is wrong. Those private equity fund managers went rushing to the courthouse. Mr. Obama made those statements. It was also said and leaked, I think, that the full weight and measure of the White House media office would be used against anybody who tried to stop the bankruptcy. As reported in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal during the next several days, all of the managers of those private equity funds went back to the courts, asked to withdraw the lawsuits because of the threats they'd received. And they asked to withdraw the lawsuits to the point that they asked that the court documents be permanently sealed to protect their identities. I'm not making this stuff up. As that was happening, I had a meeting with Governor Daniels. And we talked about what we might likely do in this case. We were stunned to see these things unfolding. And we agreed that we would probably, with other pension funds, be part of a class action suit, be an anonymous member of a class. And quite frankly, that would have been fine with me. I'm not one, I do this because it's part of the job. I don't necessarily get in front of microphones or cameras because I like to do it. Well, the next day, sitting at my desk, looking over the computer screen, 
I cannot begin to describe the feeling that hit in the pit of my stomach as I read the other pension funds that were, in fact, there were other states, but only two that had bought this debt. One was the state of California. That very week, Arnold Schwarzenegger was in this city trying to get his own $50 billion bailout. So I knew he wasn't going to buck the feds. In the other state, irony of ironies perhaps, was the state of Michigan, home of Chrysler, home of General Motors. Sitting there looking at that screen at that moment, thinking, you know, there are 305 million Americans. Why do I have to be the guy who has to be here? <laughs> As I said, I would have gladly given the job to somebody else. We brought the lawsuit, though. We brought ourselves into this case because of three fundamental points. Number one, and I'm not going to repeat all the detail that the professor gave you, but I'm just not being a lawyer. I'm going to dumb this down to my level. And some of you may understand this better if you're not lawyers. Basically, we made the argument, number one, this is a sub rosa, under the table deal. You had the United States government picking creditors, which ones would do well, which ones wouldn't, picking which assets would be kept in the package, which ones wouldn't, what the liquidation would be done, how it would be done, what the values would be, even suggestions as to which dealers would be kept and which ones wouldn't be, and it was all being put in a package for an auction in which there would only be one bidder. And guess who it was? The United States government. I just said there would only be one bidder. How did I know that would be the case? Because, in fact, it was a 10% non-refundable bid deposit you had to make, which meant about $600 million. I was pretty sure nobody else was going to show up. I was right. The second point that we argued under that sub rosa argument is that you cannot, as the professor explained, use bankruptcy just to get rid of the creditors and start all over again. That's not what bankruptcy is for. That does just send totally the wrong message. And yet you look at this so-called new Chrysler, it's effectively the same management with the same labor force, working in the same plants, with the same tools, under the same patents, with the same licenses, making the same products through the same divisions, selling them through the same dealerships. Sounds like the same company to me. Second point of our lawsuit, and these are the parts I better understand to be quite clear, that pesky old document we call the Constitution. Article 1, Section 8 says in part that the Congress shall establish uniform bankruptcy law. It began that work in 1790, and it deemed those words secured creditor to mean in the event of that nightmare scenario, you are first in line to get your money back. Doesn't guarantee you that you're going to get all your money back, but before any of the non-secureds get a penny, all the secureds would get their money back. Until, as Professor Skeel said, until Chrysler. Congress shall set bankruptcy law. It is not for the judicial system to do it, and it is certainly not for the executive. The Fifth Amendment of the United States Constitution has what is often called the Takings Clause, which surely should be called the Non-Takings Clause. It says the government cannot take the wealth of any citizen without due process of law. A couple examples of what we see are failed due process here. We receive from the Bankruptcy Court in New York at 10 o'clock on Monday, May 18th, our written notice, it was signed, certified letter, I think actually 1005, telling us if we wish to file to try to get something other than the 29 cents, we had to provide all of our trade tickets, we had to provide affidavits, we had to do depositions, we had to provide a synopsis of a financial analysis of Chrysler Corporation, and it all had to be in the Bankruptcy Court of New York by 4 o'clock the next afternoon. Does that sound like due process? I don't think so. Ultimately, we got six days to review what we received from Chrysler. We received 385,000 pages of financial documents. We had six days to review them. I don't think that's due process either. The last point of law that we raised was that TARP issue. As Dan said, the TARP bill passed in October of 2008. It was to aid the ailing financial industry. If you read the 179 pages, you'll find the word automobile appears twice, both times as an adjective in front of the word batteries. As said, Secretary Paulson testified to both the House and Senate committees saying, this isn't an automobile bailout bill. That's not who it's for. Two months later, when that auto bailout bill passed the House and then died in the Senate, 
Which begs the question, by the way. It was the same Congress. If they thought they'd bailed out the car companies in October, why did they even come back and try to pass a bailout bill in December? It's because they knew they hadn't voted to help the car companies. That bill dies, and then the Bush administration started misappropriating funds and sending them towards the auto companies. We ultimately received a short stay from the Second District Court of Appeals. Madam Justice Ginsburg issued a short stay that lasted from 3.58 on a Monday until about 7 o'clock the next day, and then the sale went forward. When the order that was issued by the Supreme Court that removed the stay, that let the sale happen, it said these words, and this is a direct quote, I do have it memorized, denial of stay is not a decision on the underlying legal merits of the case. An amazing statement to a layman to read from the United States Supreme Court. Ultimately, in August, some 60 days after they gave a 10 minute, had a ruling and gave uh, 10 minutes after that hearing, they presented their argument when they basically turned us down. 10 minutes it took them to come to a decision. It took them 60 days to write up what they had to say about our case. And I'm talking the United States Second District Court of Appeals. On that issue of Sub Rosa, they say, no, no, it really is a different company now because Fiat owns 20% of it. Okay, you know, what can you say? Yeah, you gave them 20%. Fair enough. On our points of the constitutional arguments, they come this close. I mean, this, this, this close to saying, yeah, Indiana's right. But then they say, after a tortuous argument, Indiana pensioners don't have standing. And the reason we don't have standing is because we didn't demonstrate that we could, in under any other circumstances, get more than 29 cents that we were being offered. And that comes back to the due process argument. Why? Did, because we didn't have a chance to really make the argument. On the TARP issue, and I love this language, this too is directly from the document. Indiana pensioners raise interesting and vexing questions regarding the constitutional appropriateness of the Treasury Secretary's actions in using TARP monies for the automakers. They go on to make the point that during the oral arguments, the feds actually said, well, yeah, TARP, we'll stipulate, TARP was meant for the financial industry, for the banks. But the auto industry is so related to the banks that they are, in fact, banks themselves. To which the second district wrote, if that is the standard, there is no standard, and it is inconceivable that the Congress of the United States would pass a law without their intending to be a standard. Some court, the second district wrote, really should take this case on and decide, but we don't have the authority to do so because we say they don't have standing. <laughs> because the court initially issued a stay in our case, and I may have this technically incorrect, but this is the way I think it works again in layman's terms. Because the Supreme Court initially issued a stay, we actually had a 90-day window. When the sale took place in June, the rights of all the other secured creditors vaporized. But because they took the time to hear our case, we actually had 90 days to go back to them. So in early September, we went back with, with a writ of certiorari asking the court to again review the case. At our attorney's suggestion, who's had much experience at the court, he said, let's remove from the real basis of the argument the constitutional issue. Let's even remove the TARC argument. Let's focus on the due process issues here. And that's what we've done. If four justices sign our writ, the full court will hear the case. Call me a rosy-cheeked optimist. But I have to believe Justices Scalia, Thomas, Alito, and Roberts will want to deal with the law. I'm an optimist, I really am, even after this experience. So we're hoping yet to have this case heard. Total dollar amounts, you know, I get asked all the time, well, Murdoch, what are you arguing here? Was it, was it the money, was it the principal, or was it the law? Well, yeah. <laughs> Those three things are just absolutely inseparable in this case. If we are successful, we would be quite happy to get back the six million, not billion, six million dollars that would make us whole in this case. We do not, and I say we, not just Indiana, not just Hoosiers, Americans deserve better than a government that will institute a policy that subsidizes foreign corporations while it's ripping off our own retirees. That's what we have here. 
those hardworking Hoosiers who saved, and I don't care if it's $6 million, $60, $600 million, or $6 billion. It's their money. They saved it. They've invested. And to see the minimal value that was given to fiat, and this is absolute minimal value, $400 million worth of assets on day one. And I could argue it's really about $5 billion. One other point I'll make, and that's just the way this whole valuation process happened, and perhaps Professor Skeel can talk about this better, but to the two different groups that came out of this, the secured, we were given our dollars based on liquidation value. And the experts assumed the liquidation value. There were 40 different product lines at Chrysler. Only two of the 40 had any value, according to them. They receive more than half a billion dollars a year just in a licensing agreement for the use of the name Jeep by others. And yet the whole value of this package is only supposed to be $2 billion for 40 different lines. They made assets disappear in a way which would have made David Copperfield proud. <laughs> One of the more celebrated cases here was when their chairman, Robert Nardelli, sat on the witness stand in the bankruptcy court in New York. He was asked how much the Dodge Viper, if you're not a gearhead like I am. Uh, the Viper is sort of like a Corvette. It's a big muscle car for Dodge. How much it would be worth if they sold that division off? And his answer was, oh, I don't know, maybe $5 million. Within a few moments, my phone rang from a congressman from California who said he had a group of constituents who wanted to talk to me. It's a group called the uh, Saline um, Ventures Group. They take Ford Mustangs and hop them up, have high performance. Saline Mustangs, they're called. They sent us a 44-page pre-closing agreement that they had negotiated with Chrysler in which they agreed to buy the Viper for $35 million just a couple months before. And yet now you've got the chairman sitting there, oh, maybe $5 million. That's how assets were made to be minimized in this thing. This has been an incredible experience. Uh, as I said with my friend in the plane crash, would I want to live through this again? No, but it's been interesting. It's been very eye-opening. And it has made me painfully aware that... Uh, the price of liberty is indeed eternal vigilance.